Hello, Mindy Mandel here. Today I'm going to talk about the dialogue Protagoras. This dialogue covers basically three different themes. First, what is virtue? And this is a theme that has come up in many of the early dialogues. Also, what has come up often is can virtue be taught? And then at the end of the dialogue, we're going to look at the Socratic maxim, nobody does wrong voluntarily. Now, if you saw last week's video on Hippias Minor, you saw that this theme was introduced there. It was introduced in the sense that um, that dialogue was, at least on its face, a complete failure. But I think Plato wrote it that way because he wanted the reader to think about why it failed. And that really helps us set up this dialogue here, where we see the Socratic maxim, nobody does wrong voluntarily. So I see Hippias Minor as a precursor to this video. So if you haven't seen that video, I will link it here for you. Okay, so this dialogue is going to open with Socrates just returning from a discussion with Protagoras. And Protagoras was a Greek sophist. He would travel around to the various Greek city-states and he would teach virtue. And um, so he was currently in Athens, and that's why they had this conversation. And so this is a quote from the introduction of the dialogue. And by the way, all of our translations today are from the Scottish translator William Keith Chambers Guthrie. Well, oh, that's a mouthful. Okay, so um, it opens with Socrates talking to a friend, and the friend is only labeled as friend. Um, but this friend says, oh, you've just come now from seeing Protagoras. And Socrates says, yes, we had a long talk. So the friend says, well, lose no time in telling me about your conversation. And so the whole rest of the dialogue is Socrates' retelling. And I think it's significant that it is Socrates retelling it. Sometimes it's a different person who heard the conversation. But in this case, it was Socrates himself, which means we can trust that this is going to be an accurate retelling. Okay, so Socrates starts off saying that last night, a little before daybreak, Hippocrates, son of Apollodorus, Basin's brother, knocked violently on my door with his stick, and when it was opened, he came straight in, in a great hurry. Protagoras has arrived, he said, taking his stand beside me. So Hippocrates is a young man who's obviously very excited that Protagoras is in town. In the course of this discussion that ensues here, um, we learn a few things about Protagoras. We learn that he is quite famous. We also learn that he charges a high fee to teach wisdom. And despite that high fee, or maybe because of it, we're not sure, Hippocrates wants to become Protagoras' student. He's drawn to Protagoras' reputation for wisdom. However, as he and Socrates continue talking, we learn that mm, Hippocrates isn't exactly sure what exactly it is that Protagoras teaches. What does it mean to teach wisdom? What exactly would Hippocrates learn if he became this man's student? Socrates is going to admonish him for this. He says that when it comes to something which you value more highly than your body, namely your soul, something on whose beneficial or harmful treatment your whole welfare depends. You've not consulted anybody on this question of whether or not to entrust your soul to the stranger who has arrived among us. Well, Hippocrates hears this and agrees that, yeah, Socrates, you're right. So they decide to go together to meet Protagoras. And this is what brings then Socrates to have his conversation with Protagoras. So they go to a home where Protagoras, along with two other sophists, are staying. Protagoras is staying there along with Hippias, who we met last week in the dialogue Hippias Minor. And then there's also a third sophist named Prodicus. They're staying at the home of a wealthy, influential Athenian named Callias. Now, there's a very colorful description here of the three sophists and their attentive students and how the students followed them around and I think that Plato put a lot of thought into this, thinking about what these different sophists represent and how their students behave as a result of that. And so this is a, 
there's a lot here, but I'm not going to go into it in any detail. I do encourage you to read this dialogue for yourself if you haven't done so already. It's, it's very well written. But Socrates and Hippocrates are going to approach Protagoras and explain why they've come to talk to him. And then from here, they're going to go on to their discussion. Now, rather than giving you a blow by blow of their conversation, because this is getting, the dialogues are getting a little bit longer now. Um, what I'll do instead is I'm going to discuss the main three themes. Excuse me. We can basically break down the rest of this dialogue into three areas of discussion or three themes. The first one, our classic topic here, can virtue be taught? Well, obviously, Protagoras thinks it can because he charges a high fee to do just that. So he's going to make the case that, yes, virtue can be taught. And to make his case, he's going to talk about the myth of Prometheus. Prometheus is that god who's famous for bringing humanity fire. Now, the name Prometheus means forethought. He represents, this god Prometheus, represents that rational part of the soul. And fire is, is significant in that it represents divine intellect. So the rational soul is what connects humanity to divine intellect. In metaphysics, we say that intellect is divine, and because humans are not gods, we do not actually possess intellect, but as rational beings, we can participate in intellect. And we do so through that rational part of the soul that Prometheus represents. And so that's the significance of that part of the myth. Now, less famous than Prometheus is his younger brother, Epimetheus. But he also has a significant role, at least in this part of the myth. Epimetheus means afterthought, and Epimetheus represents that lower, more animalistic part of the soul. It's often called the irrational soul in metaphysics. Now, in mythology, Epimetheus is often characterized as that bumbling fool who never means to hurt anyone, but he doesn't think things through, he's kind of stupid well-intentioned but dumb and bumbling and so he's the one who makes you shrug your shoulders and think ah he means well and you try to be patient with him in this myth epimetheus gets the task of handing out things like claws or fangs or warm fur things to survive either through hunting or to survive the cold winter and so on Epimetheus, of course, does not think it through. He hands out claws and thick fur to certain animals and venom to others and so on. But when he gets to humans, well, poor us, we're weak and feeble and can't do much of anything. We have no claws. We have no venom. We don't have thick fur like a Siberian tiger. So we're very weak. And it's because of this that Prometheus decides we need fire. So in the actual myth, not to this dialogue, but in the myth that you would read in, say, Hesiod and other sources, um, Zeus did not want humans to get fire. And so Prometheus had to sneak it to us. And when Zeus found out, he punished both Prometheus and humanity. He punishes Prometheus by tying him down and having a bird eat his liver. Now it's either an eagle or a vulture, depending on which version of the story, and sometimes it's every night, and sometimes it's every two days. But anyway, this bird eats his liver, and then in the interim, the liver heals, and so the torture can go on indefinitely. And eventually it's Hercules who saves Prometheus. But um, in this myth, there's nothing about, in this version of it, in Plato's version of it, there's nothing about that punishment. Also, in the real myth, Zeus wants to punish humanity also. And so he sends us the lovely Pandora and her infamous box. And she incidentally ends up marrying Epimetheus because of course he didn't think that one through either. But in this story, in this version of it, 
there is no Pandora. Instead, Zeus decides he's not going to punish humanity. He wants to help us. He wants to help us manage this fire, this um, participation in intellect. Now, I don't know if this is only Plato's version of it or if the historical Protagoras actually taught it this way. But for whatever reason, Plato has Protagoras send, um, has Protagoras tell the story in the way that has Zeus send Hermes, his messenger, to humanity and to give us two gifts. He gives us a share of justice and respect for others. So this is Protagoras's version of the story, that humanity had, that all humans have a share of justice and respect for others. And so because of this, we are all teachers of virtue to the best of our ability. Now, obviously, somehow or another, Protagoras is better at teaching virtue than anyone else, and that's why he's justified, apparently, in charging a very high fee. But anyway, that's his story. And so from here, Socrates wants to know, what is virtue anyway? Is it a single whole? And are justice and self-control and holiness and so on all parts of it? Or are these latter all names for one and the same thing? Well, Protagoras's response is that virtue is one, and those qualities that Socrates asked about are parts of it. And so they're going to go on and discuss this. It takes a few twists and turns, but this is the basic gist of that first part of the conversation. Now they're going to go on to the second theme. And this one, at first, it seems a little odd. They're, talking to, they're going to talk about poetry. And this comes up because Protagoras says that the most important part of a man's education, or person's education, to make it politically correct, is to become an authority on poetry. Now, at first blush, this seems like a tangent, and you're going to probably wonder, if you're anything like me, why would Plato even put this here? That's a good question to ask, because when you're, as you get to the third part, you'll realize that it all ties in together. If you're looking at why is it here, what is the point of this part of the discussion? pull out those main themes, you'll see that they will tie into the third part. And so I'm going to give you some of my main takeaways because it turns out to be important. It's not a tangent. It's actually part of the main road. It's just a road that has some twists and turns to it. Okay, so Protagoras is going to talk about a poet named Simonides. Simonides was very well respected, it seems, from, at least from the context of this dialogue. Also, he's mentioned in the Republic as well. So he was well respected, but Protagoras, he's even wiser apparently because he sees an inconsistency in Simonides' poem. He says, how can a man be thought consistent when he says both of these things? First, he lays it down himself that it's hard for a man to become truly good. When he's a little further on in the poem, he forgets. He finds fault with Pittacus, another poet, who said the same thing as he did himself, that it is hard to be noble. Well, Socrates recognizes an inconsistency in Protagoras's argument. Notice, I'm going to go back a page here. Notice that in the first part here, Simonides was talking about becoming truly good. But in the second part, he's talking about being to be noble. And Socrates is going to ask, do you think to become and to be are the same or different? And so Socrates does not see these two statements as being the same. He does not see an inconsistency. Socrates, however, does have a problem with Simonides' poem. So Simonides does not fare well with Plato, since both of these men have a problem with his poem. But Socrates sees it a little differently. Here's how Socrates summarizes the meaning of Simonides' poem. Simonides says that although to become a good man is truly difficult, yet it is possible, for a while at least, but having become good, to remain in this state and be a good man, which is what you were speaking of, Pittacus, is impossible and superhuman. This is the privilege of a god alone. 
Well, this idea that only the gods truly possess wisdom is an idea that actually comes up quite often in Plato's dialogues. There are a few places scattered throughout the dialogues where Socrates is going to say that wisdom is reserved for the gods alone. However, he says it, Socrates says it, in a different context. Because even though Socrates recognizes wisdom as something divine, he does recognize such a thing as human wisdom and human virtue. And so it ties in with this idea of virtue. The poet being discussed here, Simonides, takes the position that being good is beyond human ability. He seems to be more forgiving than Socrates is of the circumstances that might pull a person away from goodness. And they, in the course of this discussion between Socrates and Protagoras, they do quote some of the lines of the poem. Here is a line from Simonides' poem. For when he fares well, every man is good, but in ill-faring, evil. Well, I think we can all relate to this, that it's easy to sound wise when everything is going your way and there's nothing wrong going on, nothing stressful, nobody's trying to hurt you. But what happens when, say, your coworker steals one of your ideas or your significant other cheats on you or your best friend lies to you or so on? Um, there are many things that trigger us, that cause us pain or anger, and then it's a lot harder to be wise. So this idea of Simonides is a very common one. In fact, many people consider this a wise insight into human nature. Socrates, however, has a problem with it because he says that we're not talking about the average person here. We're talking about wise people. And if you're talking about someone who is wise, then this doesn't cut it. And so Socrates has his own critique of Simonides. He surmises that perhaps Simonides had in mind that he himself had often eulogized a tyrant or someone of that stamp, not of his own free will, but under compulsion. And so what Socrates is suggesting is that Simonides had an ulterior motive in wanting to rationalize away unvirtuous behavior because Simonides himself lacked virtue. He lacked courage. He was a coward. And so there were times when he would come down from that wise state of mind and act in a way that went against virtue. Okay, so after this, what seems like a tangent, Socrates and Protagoras are going to get back to their earlier discussion of virtue. And that's going to bring us to our third theme, the Socratic maxim that nobody does wrong voluntarily. Okay, what does he mean by this? And how is he going to tie in this idea of Simonides being a coward? Um, well, he says that whether we're acting out of fear, as perhaps Simonides was, or greed, or even when we're blinded by pleasure, the true culprit is that we were overcome by some form of ignorance. He says that when people make a wrong choice of pleasures and pains, that is, of good and evil, the cause of their mistake is a lack of knowledge. And what knowledge specifically? Well, this is his definition of courage. Courage is the knowledge of what is and is not to be feared. Now, I did a video on the four virtues a few weeks ago. And if you've seen that video, you would recognize that this definition is consistent with the way that I talked about courage in that video. Um, for those of you who have not seen that video, I do encourage you to watch it. I think if you watch only one past video, that would be the one to see because understanding the role of the virtues in Platonism is really key to understanding what Plato's philosophy was all about. And these ideas of the virtues are going to come up again and again and again. So if you've seen a few of my videos, you've probably already heard me recommend watching that one again. Um, but for those of you who are watching this video as the first one of my videos, I do encourage you to check out the video on the virtues. So what we see here in this dialogue, Protagoras, is that Plato is tying in this tangent about poetry 
into this main discussion of virtue. That being wise or living wisely is the real goal. It's not just that into that, you know, aha moment, that moment of inspiration when you become wise. That's obviously a meaningful moment, but we have to live it. And that means we have to embody the virtues and we have to truly live them. And to do that requires courage. So the path that Socrates is recommending is a very different one from Protagoras. It's not enough just to talk eloquently as Protagoras does. We have to truly live the virtues, not just in good times, but also when times are tough. Okay, well that brings us to the end of the Protagoras, but I'm going to continue the theme of courage next week with the dialogue Lacus. Lacus has Socrates talking about courage with two military generals. So if you like what you're seeing in this series, I do hope you'll think about subscribing and also I'd appreciate you hitting the like button. And then I hope you'll join me next week. Thank you very much.